without uh, making any delay, I will share my screen. And today we are going to discuss about this uh, randomized control trial, how to calculate the sample size. And in this session, we will focus basically on the superiority trial. We are not going to tell you the, uh, the theoretical part of the randomized control trial because that will be a separate session. We are only telling you the sample size issue, which are important and the relevant theoretical part, which may be important to calculate sample size. So a randomized control trial, we always say a clinical trial. So what is a clinical trial? So clinical trial is a term which we use for any research study, which we perform at people where the patients or the participants, a person or a human is there. And we are trying to evaluate either a medical therapy or a surgical therapy, or maybe a behavioral intervention. Because clinical trial not always means that we are going to do some surgery or medicine. Even if you are going to do like in community medicine or in public health, many a times the intervention is in the form of health education or in the form of communication strategy or in the form of behavior change strategy. So all those issues which we try to cater to the large extent to the population level also, th that we also name as the clinical trial. Randomized control trial or the randomized clinical trial is such trial where we randomize the patients or the person or the study participants. So we basically do a random allocation to the group receiving the treatment and the, there is a control group. So there is a treatment group where we want to test a particular intervention that would be a treatment group or an intervention group. And there is a comparator group where we call that comparator as a control group. And it is always a challenge to select a comparator group or a control group. There can be non-randomized trials also, like when you don't randomize the individuals and those type of trials we call as a quasi-experimental study, but we are restricting our session only to the randomized clinical trial or the randomized control trial. So now there are three types of randomized control trial. There is a superiority trial, there is a inferior non-inferiority trial, and there is an equivalence trial. So I'll again repeat it. There is a superiority trial, there is a non-inferiority trial, and there is an equivalence trial. So regarding the non-inferiority and equivalence trial, we will discuss this issue in the next session. In today's session, we are going to restrict ourselves only in terms of the superiority trial. So mostly people, whatever proposal you receive or you draft it, mostly you form this proposal by thinking this term as a superiority trial, because you always want to say or test that your intervention or your, uh, maybe it can be a drug or surgery or anything, whatever intervention you are planning, that is again, better than the existing or the standard treatment. So even if you don't categorize into a superiority, non-inferiority or equivalence, in mind, we always think of this superiority trial whenever we plan a research which, are, which is based on the principle of the randomized control trial. So in the aim of the superiority trial is that we want to demonstrate the superiority of the new therapy as compared to the previously established therapy, or in some cases, if the standard treatment is not very much acceptable, then you can take the placebo also. Although in recent days, because of the ethical concern, because in most of the diseases, there is some standard form of treatment which is available. So the use of placebo, it is not very common thing these days. So usually we compare the new treatment as against the standard treatment, which is already available. Now I'll be talking of two important concepts, which is the first is the statistical significance and the second is the clinical significance. So statistical significance, we know that whenever we talk in terms of alpha error, in terms of beta error, in terms of confidence interval, in terms of the p-value, we call it as a statistical significance. The second type of significance is the clinical significance. Now, what is this clinical significance? So based on the literature review, 
that literature review could be meta analysis, could be systematic review, could be other randomized control trial, or could be your experience, your clinical experience, wherever you are working, or maybe a group of people opine that should be a clinical significance. So there are ways to determine this clinical significance. So this clinical significance, what a clinician thinks, and the thinking process may be affected by all those things which I have enumerated, maybe a literature review, or maybe his experience or her experience, or maybe a group of people think that this should be the clinical significance. That means this much difference will be beneficial to the person or to the patient or to the study participant. That we mean by the clinical significance. It, it, it has nothing to do with the statistical significance. So now there is a hypothesis testing in superiority trial. So we learned about the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. And we always say that it is difficult to prove a alternate hypothesis. So it is always easy to reject a, a, a null hypothesis. That's why we form a null hypothesis when we conclude that there is no difference between the two treatment. In this case, in case of a superiority trial, we always set a superiority margin. Rather than I should not be saying this term always, I should be using this term we should. Because in many of the trials, you will see that the clinician, although it is a superiority trial, they have not defined the superiority margin. That means they are taking the statistical significance as a clinical significance. So in this case, you will see this superiority margin, we define this superiority margin. Let's say a new drug has come and you want to say that it, it is improving the blood pressure control in previous one was doing it in 40% of the people. And this was, is doing in maybe uh, you are saying 70, 47%, but you have set a superiority margin of 2%. That means this 2% you are not considering is as a important. So it will be significant only if it exceeds 2%. That's why this null hypothesis says that this difference of the new treatment versus the original treatment, the difference would be either less than equal to the superiority margin. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that dif this difference will be more than the this superiority margin. We will see this when we are doing the calculation also. But remember that the null hypothesis is framed differently in case of a superiority margin, where you take the difference between the two intervention. And if that value is less than equal to that superiority margin, we call it as a null hypothesis. And if this uh, difference is more than the superiority margin, we call it as a alternate hypothesis. And this superiority margin is what the clinician sets. That means difference of maybe 2%, he's not thinking that it is significant for him. That's why he has said that if my drug is more than 2% of the superior, then only I will call it as a superior or I will call it as a superiority margin. So this randomized control, this is one example, a randomized control, double blind placebo control, parallel group trial was conducted. So now there are two types of trial. You can see there are various terms which has been used here. In this case, if you see this, then you can see that it, it was a randomized control trial. It was a double blind. And then since the standard treatment was not available, so placebo was used as a method of standard comparison. And it was a parallel group. So most of the time, uh, if, you, uh, if I talk in percentages, in 70% or 70 to 75% of the cases, we do the parallel group trial where the two arm, um, they never meet each other. Whereas there is another type of trial, which is known as the crossover trial. In crossover trial, after a certain washout period, you change the arm. Um, that means the person who has uh, acted like a control, he will be now intervention and vice versa. So that crossover trial, we are not all the examples which we have taken, that is the parallel type of superiority trial, because that is the most commonly done type of trial. So in this case, the intervention was a Agnus Castus, which is a extract, dye, dry extract tablet was used, one tablet for three consecutive cycle for the treatment of premenstrual uh, tension, premenstrual syndrome. 
So you can see that 170 uh, women with diagnosed premenstrual symptom, they were recruited. In the same recruitment uh, process, 86 randomized to the intervention group and 84 to the control group. And the outcome variable in this case, it was the self-assessed score of the mood, anger, headache, irritability, breast discomfort, and one there was one more uh, this thing. So all these were taken as in the form of the visual analog score. And this visual analog score, it was graded as in a length of 10 centimeter. So there are two ways to assess this also, like you must, you, uh, you must be knowing this visual analog scale that we, we grade it from one to 10. It can be graded as a length also, because that is more objective to compare. So that uh, investigator, he has taken this as an outcome measure, like he measured this on a length 10, 10 centimeter length of the visual analog score. And he has concluded there was a mean reduction in the intervention group of 128.5 millimeter, whereas the placebo group, it was the, there was a 78.1. So there was a mean difference in 50.5 millimeter between the control group and the intervention group. Now there, there is a question for you. So the researcher has framed these three questions. And now you have to see that which of the three statement is true, if any, there can be, uh, uh, you know, all false can be there and non true uh, option is also there. So the first statement is the statistical null hypothesis states that the intervention is superior to placebo in reducing symptoms of premenstrual syndrome. So this was the first statement. So you have to write about this statement, whether it is true or false. So please write in the uh, chat box this first statement. The statistical null hypothesis states that the intervention is superior to placebo in reducing symptoms of the premenstrual syndrome. So it is false. So you are right, it is false because the null hypothesis always states that there is a no difference between the two. Uh, so yes, you are right. The second statement is, it can be concluded that placebo is ineffective at reducing symptoms of premenstrual syndrome. So now I want answer of this B option. So whether it is true or false. So there's a mixed response. There was one true, few true, and then more number of false, true and false. So there is a mixed response. There is another response which is can't say. So you cannot say that the placebo is ineffective because placebo has its own way of acting. And you can say that in this case, the placebo also, there was a reduction. If you see this previous slide, you can say that there was a mean reduction. This placebo group also, there was a reduction in 78.1 millimeter. So there is an article where, the, we, where they have emphasized on the role of placebo. Yes, psychological effect of placebo. It also works. It, you cannot say that placebo is ineffective at reducing symptoms of the premenstrual syndrome. And then you can see that the research hypothesis states that the intervention is superior to placebo at reducing symptoms of premenstrual syndrome. So what about this option? Is it right or is it wrong? So yes, this is true. So in this, uh, this uh, C statement is true, but the research hypothesis states that the intervention is superior to placebo at reducing symptoms of the premenstrual syndrome. Now, consider the following scenarios and you have to respond in the chat box. So you plan to test the effectiveness of a new drug, which is X, and the patients which you recruited, those are the hypertensive patients. And already there is a drug which is uh, going on in the market that is a standard drug, S. So now you have designed the RCT and you have uh, obtained this, these uh, figures. So you can see here that uh, there, uh, these, this is the blood pressure. The first, this thing is, the first row is showing you the mean blood pressure on the patient who are on standard drug, which was already there in the market. And the mean SBP was 128 millimeter with a standard deviation of eight millimeter. And the blood pressure of the patient on drug X, it was 118. And the standard deviation was 10. So the outcome, in this case is the difference in the mean SBP. So now what is the mathematical difference between the mean of two group? So please write in the chat box. So yes, it is 10. Yes, you are right, it is 10. So in this case, all of you are right that it is 10. Now you see the second 
scenario. There was another investigator who did the similar study and who found out that the blood pressure of patients on drug S, the mean SBP was 128 and the standard deviation was 8. Similarly, the new drug, with the new drug, the patient reported the mean SBP was 126 with a standard deviation of 10 millimeter. In this case now, what is the mathematical difference between the two? So yes, you are right that it is two. So in the previous one, it was 10. In this case, it is two. So now which outcome is better? Can you write in the chat box? So we can remember the first is the uh, first scenario and the second scenario. So yes, uh, there is a first, then second, and then I can't say, or, 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 okay. So there is mixed response. So if you see this outcome one and outcome two, and this third is the can't say. So th this is right. So yes, the true answer is we can't say. Why? Because we don't know what was the sample size. So it all depends the number of samples which are which is used to get these results. So now you can see in the first case, when you were having a difference of 10 millimeter, the number of samples was 10 in each arm. And in that case, it was not significant. And the p-value was 0.516. Whereas in the second scenario, where there was a difference of only two millimeter, you can see here that the number of samples which was used was 100. So now can you understand between these two? So in the first case, there is no statistical significance. But in the second case, there is a statistical significance. And the statistical significance is due to the increased sample size because of the more sample size. So in sample size, we always say this, if you take huge number of person, maybe more than required number also, even a small difference will be statistically significant. But it is not necessary that small difference will be clinical, clinically significant. In this case, maybe that 10 millimeter difference may be significant, but since you have taken a small sample size, it will not come as a statistical significance. So that's the difference between a clinical significance and the statistical significance. I will again uh, repeat it, a small difference, which is not clinically significant. As a clinician, if you are uh, getting a two millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, you are not bothered why to introduce a new drug. So as a clinical significance, this two millimeter reduction is not important for you. For you, it is a 10 millimeter, which is important. But if you take less sample size, then the clinical, is, clinical significance become the statistical insignificant. And if you take very huge sample size, clinically, which is insignificant values there, that will become very much statistically significant. So you want both the things. You want clinical significance also, and you want statistical significance also. That's why we always ask and say that you should do your study with the appropriate sample size, because then there are chances that you will detect that clinically significant difference. So mathematically, a large difference can be statistically non-significant if the sample size is small. And mathematically, a small significance can be, a difference can be a statistically significant if the sample size is big. Now, again, consider the following two scenarios and you have to respond in the chat box. So you plan to test the effectiveness of a new drug X1 and X2 in hypertensive patients in comparison to a standard drug S. And you have designed the RCT to obtain the following outcome. So you can see these two scenario. So blood pressure of patient on drug S and these two are done on the same handed number of individual in the both arm. So the mean SBP in the first case, the person who, are, he, who is on drug, drug S is 128 millimeter with a standard deviation of eight. And the mean blood pressure on drug X1 is 126 millimeter. So there was a mean difference of two millimeter and the p-value, we have not given you the confidence interval here. We are talking in terms of p-value, although we know that these days we talk in terms of the confidence interval. But just to maintain the simplicity of this webinar, we have kept this p-value and this p-value is 0.004 here. 
Similarly, in the case scenario second, you can see here that the difference is this is 128 and this is 180, although the sample size is same. And now here you can see that the value is this, this thing, 0 0.02, this P value. So the question is, which outcome is better? Scenario one or scenario two? So again, the same outcome one, outcome two, and can't say. So scenario two. So in this case, from a clinical point of view, an average reduction of two millimeter is not significant. So that's why this average reduction of 10 millimeter is significant for you. And in this case, most of many of you have written that yes, the reduction in 10 millimeter is important. Although if you see the statistical significance, if you see this statistical significance, this is more statistically significant seeing the p-value. But seeing the difference for a clinician, this will be more appropriate. This uh, clinical significance as well as statistical significance. And that's why in the beginning, we talked about this clinical significance and statistical significance because in superiority trial, we will be doing the same. We will be taking the clinical significance more than the statistical significance. So a statistically significant difference will be clinically non-significant if the value is below the desired margin. And a statistically significant difference will be clinically significant if the value is above the desired margin. And this desired margin in randomized control trial is called as the clinically meaningful margin, or we also call it as a least relevant margin. Again, to re repeat it, this de desired margin, which we have set, which is not clinically very important for us. This is known as the, the, this, uh, the margin, which is important for us, is known as the clinically meaningful margin or the least relevant margin. That means at least minimum difference of this much should be there between the two intervention and the control arm. Now, who will decide about this clinical meaningful difference? So an investigator should decide the person who is drafting the proposal, the person whose research idea is should decide about this, uh, this uh, difference, clinical meaningful difference. And this is a very, uh, in fact, we can say this is a very tricky task. So it is usually done on the basis of a sort of literature review. You do an extensive literature review. You read meta-analysis, you read the systematic review, other type of randomized control trial of the same research question. And then on the basis of those results and your experience, you decide the difference, what difference is clinically meaningful to you. And that depends on the objective of the study also, on the research question also. For example, if you are studying a suicide rate, even a small reduction in the rate of suicide will have a significant impact on the lives of the people who are at risk of committing suicide. Whereas if you are doing something on sedentary lifestyle or some lifestyle changes or lifestyle modification, then we may aim at a larger reduction, a small reduction because this is not that fatal. So if the disease is very fatal or if the outcome is in the terms of mortality, then even a small reduction is improved, is very important. Whereas if you are talking of something like improvement in quality of life or in some morbidity or you know, some reduction in lifestyle, improvement in lifestyle, definitely very small reduction is not very clinical, clinically significant for us. Now, we, as we uh, have uh, done three, I think this is the fourth one this fourth webinar on sample size calculation. So we have done that. Generally, we describe our outcome or the output, which we have to enter as a, in the form of a categorical variable or in the form of a continuous variable. So you need to identify in a randomized control trial also, when you are going to calculate the sample size, which variable you are interested in. Do you want to calculate the difference in the mean of the two set? or do you want to calculate the proportion? So if you are interested in proportion difference, then you should take the difference of proportion or proportion of the outcome in the control group 
and then proportion of outcome in the intervention group. And then you should set the alpha level. So alpha is the type one error. And then you should set the power. Usually alpha is set at 5%, power is set at 80%. And then you do the adjustment. These adjustments are usually done for the non-response rate. But if you are interested in comparison of two means, then you should take either the mean difference or the mean outcome in the compare, compare uh, this intervention group versus control group, the standard deviation, maybe the individual standard deviation, because from the individual only you will calculate the pool standard deviation. Again, the alpha level, that is the type one error, which is set as 5% level, the power or the beta that is 100 minus beta that is set at usually 80%. And then again, you do adjustment for non-response. So if you have like odds ratio, we have discussed this too in the previous session, how to calculate proportion. So if you have odds ratio, and you, if you want to use proportion, then using this formula, you can calculate odds ratio from proportion. So superiority trial always aims to demonstrate the superiority of the new therapy. So the investigator always believes that this new therapy is superior to the existing therapy. That's why this is not a very commonly done trial. Most of the time these days, non-inferiority and equivalence trial are done. A superiority trial, people write it and they do it also. But the problem in superiority trial that you will always, you have to demonstrate that the new therapy is superior to the existing therapy. And if you fail to prove that, then there are chances that uh, it will not be accept uh, acceptable in the market. Although if you read this uh, type of clinical trial, it is always said that if the superiority trial is not uh, significant, you cannot say that the drug is inferior or the drug is non-equivalent or equivalent because there may be other issues also, which we are not going to discuss now. So the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis in superiority trial, we will see here, we have seen about that null and alternate hypothesis. Now we will talk of the superiority margin also. So you can see here, this is a diagrammatic representation where the red line is for the null hypothesis and green line is for the hypothesis, this alternate hypothesis. So if there is this uh, mid uh, point of these two lines where these two are of equal length, you can say that there is no difference between the two treatment. And here there is a difference, but you, you are saying that you have kept the superiority margin to zero. We'll see this. And then again, there is a non-inferiority type of trial where you are saying that this much inferiority you are able to accept it. So let's say this is 5%, the new drug, is 5% less effective. But if it if generally non-inferiority trial is done for secondary outcome, like if the drug is cheaper, if the intervention is less invasive, if it has got less side effect, then we do the non-inferiority trial. Then there is a strong superiority. So generally we do this strong superiority where you set a superiority margin. That means this 5%, if the drug will be more than 5% effective, then only you will take it as a clinically significant. So in this case, their concepts come as a clinical significance as well as statistical significance. And in equivalence trial, you decide both plus and minus. So we will discuss about this equivalence and non-inferiority maybe in the next session. So now let's see what are the steps in the sample size calculation. So a sample size calculation is you start with a research question you identify that research question, you identify the study variables too, like mean and proportion. Then you do a thorough literature review. And I said that difference also, you have to see that what is should be the clinical significant difference you are going to accept in your research. Then you set the parameters for the sample size calculation. You calculate the sample size, you do the adjustment based on your research question, and then you do the write-up for that sample size. So these are some basic steps for the sample size calculation. So now following aspects needs to be considered. We have discussed that, but we will again repeat it. So the first is the least relevant significance or the clinical significance. 
So we have discussed about this clinical significance, how much should the new intervention be better than the reference intervention. So this is important that you have to set like maybe 10 millimeter, like we have seen two millimeter versus 10 millimeter. So how much difference you think that it is clinically significant. So that clinical significance is very important here. It is not just only the statistical significance which will play a role. Rather, the clinical significance carry more value than the statistical significance. Then the second is the random variation in the intervention effect. So the how much new intervention should be better than the reference intervention. And here comes the value of the variance, which is the sigma square. The third is the type 1 error rate. So this type 1 error rate, it determines the level of significance. We have discussed it, this that the when we reject the null hypothesis, when it is true, the, it is known as the type 1 error rate. That means percentage of, we, if we set as 5%, this type 1 error rate, that means there are only 5% chances that your result which has come, that is by chance. Otherwise, in 95% of the cases, you are right. The fourth is the type 2 error rate. So type 2 error rate is the determined, we take par with the, this type 2 error rate. And type 2 error rate is the 100 minus beta, where beta is the, uh, you're accepting the null hypothesis when it was false. So it determines the par. That means if you have set the par at 80%, that means you are 80%, there are chances that you will detect that difference, clinical significant difference in your study. So these are the inputs which are needed if you want to calculate the sample size. So you need a proportion. We have discussed that there can be two types of uh, input. There could be a categorical or a binomial variable, which will be in the form of proportion or percentage, or there will be mean of the outcome in the standard treatment group. So there will be expected proportion or mean of outcome in the new intervention group then there will be a minimally clinical acceptable difference, which we have discussed about this superiority margin. And then there will be a level of significance, power of the study and type of hypothesis, whether it is a one-sided hypothesis or a two-sided hypothesis. Now let's do the calculation. So now first we'll see the calculation for a continuous outcome. So there are two types of approach. In cohort study and in case control, you have seen the use of the difference in two proportion and difference in two means. So many a times what people say, what we have observed, because we have calculated many sample size of the superiority trial, and we have seen that they use the equality concept. And we'll see what that equality concept is. So this is one of the common approach. This we have seen in the calculation of sample size for the cohort and for the case control. Whether this u plus v square, this u was the, uh, this power at the, the 80%, uh, the value of this u is 0.84. This v is the desired level of statistical significance, which is set as 5% level of alpha, and the value is 1.96. This sigma one is the standard of uh, this uh, standard deviation of outcome in the exposed. This sigma zero is the standard de deviation of the outcome in the non-exposed. And here you take the difference between these two, mu one minus mu zero, that is the mean difference of the outcome in both the groups. So this formula we have seen and we have calculated also. So many people, they calculate it using this formula. But we do recommend to use this approach, which takes this, uh, this u plus v square multiplied by sigma square divided by this d. So d is the expected mean difference due to intervention. And this sigma is the minimal clinical acceptable mean difference. So this is superiority margin. We call it as a superiority margin. And we'll see how to set this superiority margin. So it, this U represents the desired power at, uh, this is typically 0.84 for 80% power. This V represents the desired level of statistical significance, which is 1.96 at 5% level of alpha. And this sigma square is the pool standard deviation of the outcome. 
and this d and sigma we have discussed this uh, delta not sigma i'm sorry this is delta so now we will start with the examples so let's see this first example and this is for the continuous variable so i will answer all these questions which you people are posting in the chat at the last because i could see many questions but but we'll take these questions one by one maybe uh, the last so now in this first is the effectiveness of community based football compared to the usual care in men with prostate cancer so they have taken the patients of prostate cancer and it was a this was a community uh, trial and they have used this community uh, this football care in one group and in the second group they have used a usual care and this was also a the parallel uh, type of trial and uh, the, they have mentioned it as a superiority trial and we will see and the, their hypothesis was that this community based football approach this is better than the usual care so the primary objective of this football care prostate community trial was to determine whether the community based football is superior to the usual care for improving cancer specific quality of life after 2 12 weeks of participation so this excerpt we have taken from the article itself so all these write up which you have seen which you are seeing here this we have taken from the actual article and we are just checking the way they have calculated the sample size so you can see here that the sample size calculation is based on the detection of the minimal clinical important difference between the groups so they have taken this difference mini significant difference or the clinical difference which we were talking as six point so they have taken that the intervention group should be at least six point more in terms of quality of life score than the control group using this fact p questionnaire and they have done it at 12 weeks and the standard deviation which they have taken that is the 15 points so the difference between the mean is six point and the standard deviation is 15 and they have taken a two sided this significance level at 5% and the power of 80% was chosen so we will see how to calculate this so we have just tabulate this input variable for the ease so you can see here six unit was for this is the difference minimum expected improvement in quality of life the score and this 15 unit was standard deviation so in this case this 6 point is not the superiority margin we will see he has where the author uh, doesn't mention about the superiority margin you consider that this superiority margin is 0 0 that means they are taking both this clinical significance and statistical significance same and we will see this how you can do this in the calculation of form formula so i'll just open the statulator so uh, what should i open this is the uh, mean so if this is a statulator for the people who are uh, doing it for the first time here you can see that sample size is this is the two we will write like compared to independent proportion independent means so in this case you can see here that we can use the expected difference between the mean because the expected difference of the mean in this case was 6 unit so i am not so you can uh, do this resetting and in the uh, upper if you see this let me show you can you see this there are four options equality non inferiority superiority and equivalence so many a times what we have seen that the people use this equality where they don't uh, talk about any superiority margin and they don't talk about the superiority so in this case we have calculated it and you can see here that if you this is the uh, a very common approach which people they they do it so if i use this expected difference between the mean so expected difference of the mean was 6 unit which was set by the by, by the researcher 
and the standard deviation was 15 units and this 5% and 80% was the uh, power and the uh, alpha level. So the, you can see here that the a total sample size in each group was 99. So if you see the, uh, the, if you see the article, in this case, you can see that they have taken, so this was, uh, we, we, I think in this slide, we have not shown you, maybe in the previous one, so they are, uh, th that we have uh, not taken. So the, uh, the appropriate sample size using equality as a principle was 99. But if I use the other one, that is the superiority one. So I will go and click on this superiority. And in this case, if you click on this superiority, you can say that this you can take as a six. But here you will see it always talks about the superiority margin. So this margin you have to set at zero and the sample size, it will be different because the formula is different. And if you calculate it, it will, it is 78. So actually by using the superiority margin as zero, your sample size is always less than the equality, which uh, many people do, but generally you should use either non-inferiority, superiority or equivalence concept when you are calculating the sample size for randomized control trial. So now did you appreciate the difference when we did the equality, this, this when you do it, this six and 15, it gives you a sample size in each arm as 99, this 99. And when you change it to superiority, set this to six and this margin, because they, this that was a clinical significance difference they have not said that that is the superiority margin. So wherever you don't mention about the superiority margin, you should take it at zero. That means both statisticals, you are taking <clears throat> the clinical significance as statistical significance. In that case, your null hypothesis will be that there is no difference between the two treatment and your alternate hypothesis will be the difference of the two treatment should be minimal that acceptable clinical difference which you have set. Are you getting the concept? Am I making sense to all of you? If there is any problem in this concept, then I will repeat it. Okay, so I'll again, once again, repeat it. In this case, there are, there are two things. Uh, if you see this tattulator, you can see in the upper, uh, this ribbon, there are four options. Equality, non-inferiority, superiority, and equivalence. So this equality we have used when we have used the concept of sample size calculation in case control study and in cohort study, because there also the outcome is in the form of maybe percentages or maybe in the form of mean. So that's why uh, generally we have used this equality. But when you have to do the calculation of sample size in case of a randomized control trial, you should use these three options. Either you should use non-inferiority or you should use superiority, or you should do use the equivalent style. So I will show you using both these. If you forget, I mean, you did not click any of these and you have used this as a calculation of formula, I mean, as a calculation of your randomized control trial. So in the example given, we have seen that the example was showing that I'll, I'll maximize it. Can you see that the minimal expectable that the clinical difference Minimal clinical difference we have taken is of six units. We have we expect that we expect that the person or the group of people who have undergone this football, uh, this uh, care treatment, their quality of life score will be six unit better than the people who have undergone the usual care. So this was the clinical difference, but they have not mentioned regarding any margin on that. So you can take it as a clinical significant difference. And then the standard deviation is 15 units. And the rest too, you know, you, 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 we usually keep it as 5% and 80% that alpha level and the power. So now coming to this calculation of sample size and the statulator, you can see here that this input. So from the sample size calculation, I have selected this option of comparison 
using two independent means. If you click this, you can see here there are two options. There is an option of expected mean and there is an option of expected difference between the mean. So if I use select this equality, which I have used in the case control and cohort, and then I if I enter this, so my difference between the two means were six. And the standard deviation was 15. And with this option, if I calculate the sample size for the randomized control trial, it will come as 99. 99 in each group. That means total of 198. And write up, you can see here, you have to write that assuming a pool standard deviation of 15 units, the study would require 99 in each group to assume that the group sizes are equal. In this case, in today's example, we will show you every time the group sizes to be equal and to achieve a power of 80% and a level of significance of 5% for detecting the true difference between uh, in the means between the test and the reference group of six units. So this is the write-up. You can modify this write-up depending on your research question. So if you click this, 99 is the sample size. But ideally, this many people do this way. But ideally, what is recommended that you should be doing it with the superior using these three options, non-inferiority, superiority, or equivalence. If you are thinking that your treatment is always superior, then in that case, if you are not sure, many, usually you should give this superiority margin. But we have seen and we have uh, reviewed many articles of superiority trial, and we have found out that they never mention superiority margin. So in that case, you can take this superiority margin as zero. That means this zero means that they consider this clinical significance and statistical significance same. That means they say that even if the difference is of one millimeter, remember, can you recall that difference of two millimeter of blood pressure? So for those researchers, even the one millimeter difference of blood pressure is significant for them. So that's why even more than zero, any value is significant for them. So that we mean by the superiority margin. And here in this case, the difference of two mean is six. So if you calculate the sample size using this and click this, then sample size is 78. So can you, can you visualize that using this option, actually your required sample size is less than the equality. So ideally, if you use this option by keeping this superiority margin as zero, your sample size requirement gets reduced. And then it is more feasible for you to uh, conduct the study. So that's how, that's why we usually say that if you're too sure that uh, this is the, uh, you know, you, have, you don't want to set any margin and you are sure that even the one millimeter or two di millimeter difference will be clinically significant for you, then you will set the margin as zero and you will uh, write the difference between the two mean and the expected difference. So this uh, we mean by the clinically uh, significant difference uh, with the superiority margin. So this superiority margin zero means any difference between the two variable or the two outcome, we will consider that this is significance. We are not testing that if the difference, this superiority margin means like if you are testing two blood pressure uh, group, a two blood pressure medicine, antihypertensive. In one group, if already there is a different, the, if one or there is a standard treatment, and if the new treatment has come up, and you want to say that this new treatment should reduce the blood pressure in excess of two millimeter, that means if the blood pressure reduction is of two millimeter, it is of no importance to you. That's why you don't consider that two millimeter difference as a clinically significant. So that's why you set that superiority margin. That means if your reduction in blood pressure is more than two millimeter, then only it, it will be significant. And the sample size then calculated based on that two millimeter superiority margin. Like in this case, if I set this as one, maybe one, by uh, keeping this superiority margin one means, I think that if the difference in quality of life score is one, then for me, it is not significant. Like if I, I am giving so much emphasis on football care, 
you know there are separate group of people who are teaching the football care to those people and at the end what happened there is a gain of only one one point and i think that that is not significant for me so i have preset that margin and if then i calculate it see my sample size is increased to 112 so by keeping a superiority margin actually what you are doing you are telling the reader or the person who are a researcher that you don't consider a small difference as a clinically significant difference that's why you will set the null hypothesis that if the difference is equal to that value or less than that then it will be it is not significant for me so it is significant only if it is more than one point score right and if you see if you say that no even change of one score is important for me then you will keep it as zero in that case the sample size requirement will be 78 so it is the entire the researcher discretion what do you want to do and many a times we do reverse way also like if you want less sample size then you may keep this superiority margin as zero okay so now the uh, uh, can you understand the difference between this superiority margin of zero and maybe one or two depending on your research question and am i making sense to all of you by saying that you know this clinical significance and the statistical significance so i can see few messages so that's all right so i'll i'll carry on with my presentation and maybe few questions uh, we can take up in the end also so now this is the uh, second uh, ideal uh, so before that clinical and statistical significance we have discussed that for us it is both clinical and statistical significance which is important because if you increase the sample size even we have seen that even 1 mm of difference will come as a 0.0001 significant highly significant but that 1 mm reduction of a blood pressure we don't think that it is very significant that's why we we call it that uh, no that will be maybe our margin superiority margin so now the second question the second uh, research question or the article which we have selected that is the physical rehabilitation versus no physical rehabilitation after total hip and knee arthroplasties and in this case it was also a parallel trial a superiority trial randomized control so we have also taken this excerpt from the article itself and the objective of the trial was to compare the effectiveness of home based tele rehabilitation home based rehabilitation and no physical rehabilitation so there were three arms and a set of people while like one group of person who went for this total hip replacement and total knee replacement so the primary outcome is the hip disability and the osteoarthritis outcome score which we call as the push and kush so this is the uh, hip disability outcome score and osteoarthritis outcome score and they it was assessed at the end of 6 weeks so the sample size a clinically important difference of 10 points they have taken that this difference if there is a difference between 10 points they have of uh, the score between 0 and 6 weeks that will be considered significant from them and that is the scale which assess the daily living uh, adequate daily living and uh, although they have written that this is used as our superiority margin with they have taken as expected standard deviation of 20 points a power of point that 80% significant level of 5% so now they have written that the required sample size was 15 in each group so we will see this Uh, what sample size comes if you enter this so remember this clinical important difference was of 10 point and this uh, if you see the expected standard deviation this was 20 although they have written it as a superiority margin but you will see that this was not actually the superiority margin so you go to the statulator again you reset this it is taking some time again we can choose this difference between means and you can say that the expected difference in mean it was 10 and this is it was 20 the standard deviation and i have clicked this superiority here and this margin 
this difference they have taken 10 because the difference between the two treatment they have not written and if i take it as zero and calculate it you can see that the required sample size is 50 so this 50 and can you see here superiority margin was zero percent here but in the write-up what they have written i think they have written that this was the they have written the clinically important difference of 10 points. So this was the clinical difference. And it is not used as a superiority margin. This is not a right way of writing. Because superiority margin, you know now what is a superiority margin. Superiority margin, when you set extra apart from that clinical important, importance difference. So now with this, when I set this to zero, you will see that the sample size has come to 50 in each group. That means the superiority margin they have taken as zero because they, they take, they have considered this uh, clinical significant difference as a, static, a statistical significant difference. So the difference only, so in most of the trials which uh, got published, the superiority trial, we have found out that none of them, they have mentioned this superiority margin. This they have not mentioned. So all the sample size calculation, which we have done, that is by keeping this uh, value as zero. And then the sample size was coming. In this case, you have seen. And if like, uh, if you use this equality, then you can see this 10 and 20, this will come as 63. So the sample size actually gets increased if you use this equality. Otherwise, you should use this superiority option and you keep this as a zero and this expected difference of in this case, for this case, and if you calculate, then you can see it is the 50. So now this we have done. Now it's the time for you to do the practice. So all of you, please see this carefully. And if you are on two system, or uh, you can open that system to calculate the sample size. So the study protocol was the intratympanic versus the intravenous corticosteroid treatment for certain sensory neural hearing loss in diabetic patients, right? So the outcome here was the uh, this uh, two treatment and they want to see that hearing loss was less in which type of group. So the objective was to determine whether the intratympanic corticosteroid administration is better primary treatment option of patients with diabetes mellitus. And the primary outcome which they measured, they have measured the change in this PTA. And this PTA is the pure tone average. So they have done a pure tone average at uh, like in the baseline and then at the level of uh, after 30 days. And you can see here, this is the same write-up which we have taken from the article. And the purpose of the proposed study is to compare the effectiveness of this pure tone average by one-sided t-test, which is used with the 95% confidence interval method. The difference in PTA is reported in previous publication as 30.7 in the experimental group and 28.7 in the control group. So you need to see the previous literature. And they have written like there was a difference of 10. The difference in the mean was 2. And the combined standard deviation was 3. Again, they have taken as a this uh, type 1 error as 2.5% and statistical power as 90%. So difference in pure tone average they have taken as 2 decibel standard de deviation three decibel, level of significance as 2.5%. And then this uh, power of study is 9%, 90, 90%. So again, coming to the statulator, this is again the difference in mean. So you can uh, uh, use this, this was two difference. And here you can see this was standard deviation was three margin two and here you first you press this calculate again you have to go to this option you change this desired power to 90 percent because they have taken power as 90 percent so i've kept this power as 90 percent 
and this level of significance they have reduced it to 2.5 so you will make it 2.25 and then you can update it so you can see the sample size was 51 in this case so here they have changed the value of alpha and beta so although i have done this for you okay good now there is one more question for you this i will not do first first you have to answer then i'll show so the research question is whether there is a difference in the efficacy of this ACE2 antagonist, which is the new drug, and ACE inhibitor, which is a standard drug for the treatment of primary hypertension. So the change of sitting diastolic blood pressure is the primary measurement, and this is the input. So the mean change of this diastolic blood pressure standing in the standard treatment was 14. In the new treatment was 18. Clinically acceptable superiority margin. Here, this is a hypothetical example which we have taken from a textbook. So there they have written this clinically acceptable superiority margin is as 3 millimeter. Pool standard deviation 6 millimeter. Level of significance 5% and the power of study 80%. So in this case, uh, you have to write this. Uh, you have to tell me what is the sample size in this case. All of you, please calculate. I'm also doing. So I'll go to the statulator. Here the formula which I will use, that is the difference in mean. So the difference in mean, I, I may select this. So mean of the reference group, it was 14. And the mean of the test group, mean reduction was 18. Then standard deviation was 6. And superiority margin they have set as 3. And if I press this calculate, so yes, you are right, it is 446. So total sample size will be 892, 446 per arm. So this, all of you are right. So now you know how to calculate a sample size. Now coming to the second type of uh, variable. So the first type is the, when you take the outcome as a mean, change in mean score or change in mean value. Now, when you have to do the outcome variable as dichotomous outcome, in that case, you have to take the percentages. So in that case, again, there is a common approach and there is a recommended approach. Here also, the, many people, they do it with the equality concept and many people, they do it with the superiority concept. So this was the sample size formula to compare to independent proportion. And if you see this, we have used this in the sample size calculation for case control and cohort studies also. So this U represents the desired power, which is typically 0.84 for 80% power. And this V is the 1.96, which is at the 5% level of alpha. And this P1 and P2, this is P1 is the proportion of that outcome in group one. P2 is the proportion of outcome in group two. And this P is the average proportion. That is the P1 plus P2 by two. But the recommended approach using that superiority margin, it is the U plus V square where this U represents the desired power, which is 0.84 for 80%. And this V represents the desired uh, level of statistical significance, which is 1.96 for 5% alpha. And then you can uh, see this, this PT represents, represents the proportion of that outcome in the treatment group. And this P, C, the incidence or the proportion of outcome in the control group. And this D, tells you the expected uh, difference, proportion difference due to intervention. And this delta is the minimally acceptable, this difference, which is the superiority margin. So this is one article which we have selected, like close incision, negative pressure wound therapy versus standard dressing in obese women undergoing a cesarean section. So they took the women 
uh, who have undergone cesarean section, who are undergoing cesarean section, and the control arm was the standard dressing, and the intervention arm was the close incision negative pressure wound therapy. And by this, they want to test the outcome was a proportion of women who developed surgical site infection. So this was also a parallel group randomized trial. And in this study, they aim to compare the effectiveness and safety of prophylactic close incision, this, this non-pressure wound therapy. This is the NPWT, which they have written, non-pressure wound therapy, and a standard surgical dressing on the cumulative incidence of the surgical site infection in obese women undergoing elective and semi-urgent cesarean section. So in the statistical analysis, you can say that it's they, we have taken this from the article. So they have calculated the sample size on the basis of the proportion of women who developed a surgical site infection within 30 days of cesarean section. On the basis of the previous work, they have conservatively estimated that 15% of the women in the control group were likely to develop the surgical site infection. And they have written that following discussions with the infectious disease experts and obstetricians, they determined that an absolute reduction of 5% will be clinically important. So they have taken this difference as a 5%. And then the sample size needed to detect a reduction in the cumulative incidence at 30 days from 15% to 10% at 90% power and 5% significant level. So we'll see this 15% to 10% at 90% power. And they have calculated the sample size as 1045 per group. So we will open this. Now I have to select this option of compared to independent proportion. So I have clicked this compared to independent proportion. And in this case, again, there are two options, equality and superiority. First, I'll show you with the equality. So the expected outcome proportion in the reference group. This reference group is the group, which is the uh, uh, no, control group. So the control group, it was 10%. So you can write here that it was 10%. And in the uh, this group, they have expected it to be Sorry, it was at 15% because you it's a negative outcome. So you want it to be reduced. And this was 10% in the test group, surgical site infection. So it is 10%. And it is at the 90% power. So if you calculate this at 80%, this is 723. You go to the option, you change this 90%, 80% to 90%. So I have changed this to 90 and I have updated this. So you can see it is 954 approximately. They have calculated it to be 1024 in each. Now let's do it with the superiority. So if you click this superiority, you can see here that the expected proportion here will be 15 because this is the control arm. And in this arm, they have expected 10. And this margin, you can see that they have taken as zero. So I have taken as zero. And now if you calculate this, this required sample size is 578. And if I adjust it for 90%, so it will be 785. So it is less. So they must have done using this equality option where we were getting a sample size of 900 something. So this was first uh, option. This was first example to show you how to calculate the sample size. And in this case, you can see that there was a 10% attrition also. So if you, uh, if you add that 10% attrition, I think it will be equal to 1024. So in this case, it was 0.15. And this was 10%. And let's do this uh, calculation, this option adjustment for power. So it was 90. And then 954 if you add 5%. So 10% of 954 will be 10 approximately. 
this uh, 95. And if you uh, have the 95, 42, so it will be like, it will be somewhere near to, so nine, uh, okay, it was 10%. So 954 plus 95. You can, I will calculate this. 954 plus 95. So approximately 1049. And they have taken it 1024. But it is they have they must have used this formula only, that formula of equality. So now coming to the second example. So this was formula which we, we have given you that formula which is there in the slide. Uh, the same uh, we have shown you this one. If you use the equality, this is the formula for the superiority trial. And this is the formula for the equality. So th they have used this formula. Although we do it in the calculator, but you can write, you should write the formula also. Whatever calculator we use, we use, you should write the formula. So if you are using the option of equality, you should use this formula. If you use the option of this uh, superiority margin, then you should use this formula. Now coming to the second example. On chronic hepatitis C <coughs> cases, a pegylated interferon, which is a type of intervention, plus ribavirin. It was given for three months and it was seen that they induce sustained virological response in 40% of the cases. So another individual wishes to test a new therapeutic regimen, which increased this response in 60% of the patients. Now with the 80% power and 5% significance level, please calculate the sample size. In case if, if it is a superiority trial. In this case, you also do, I'm also doing along. So remember 40% and 60%. So response in the control group is 40%. So you can do it as like 40%. And in the treatment group, it was 60%. So if, if you use using this equality, it will come to 104. And if you take this superiority, again, this will be 40. This will be 60. And this margin, I have kept it as zero. And then press calculate. So you can see it is 84 in each arm. Yes, you are right. So now there's another question for you. Prophylactic platelet transfusion plus supportive care. So the intervention group was prophylactic platelet transfusion plus supportive care. And the standard treatment was supportive care alone. In case of a patient's adults with dengue with thrombocytopenia. And it was also a parallel randomized control trial, which was a superiority trial. They have written it as a superiority trial. So they have written that a little evidence exists to guide decision on prophylactic platelet transfusion. To address this evidence gap, they designed a study comparing prophylactic platelet transfusion and supportive care with supportive care alone to test the hypothesis that the prophylactic platelet transfusion was efficacious and safe in the prevention of bleeding in adult in patients with dengue and thrombocytopenia. And the definition of thrombocytopenia, they have taken as less than 20,000 platelets. So they hypothesized that the prophylactic platelet transfusion in patients with dengue and thrombocytopenia, they reduce the clinical bleeding by 50%.
but in a pre in a previous in a clinical study in a previous study in the same hosp uh, hospital in the Tan Tok Sang Hospital, clinical uh, bleeding occurred in ten percent of the patients with a platelet count of twenty thousand or below, with a power of eighty percent and one sided, and assuming five percent dropout rate. Initially, they calculated four participants, but then they got the result of their own study, and they got that the higher clinical bleeding frequency of twenty percent. in patients with a platelet count of 20000 so now they have taken that if with the standard treatment there was a bleeding of 20% and with this they have hypothesized that it will be reduced by 50% means 20 uh, if we take 50% of 20 it will be 10% so the incidence of clinical bleed, bleeding in dengue patients of thrombocytopenia on supportive care was 20% and with this new therapy where they are giving the prophylactic uh, transfusion of platelet this they have hypothesized that it will reduce to 50% that means 50% of 20 will be 10% and at 5% level and 80% power of the study all of you please calculate the sample size i am also doing it so i'll go to the statue later so 50% or oh, this you can say the uh, 20% so outcome in the control group was 20% and in the reference group it was 10% because it got reduced in the by 10 uh, 50% so it was 10% superiority margin was uh, taken as zero so it was 170 four in each arm yes you are right now there is another question the research question is whether there is a difference in efficacy of mitzapin new drug and sertraline which is a standard drug for the treatment of resistant depression in 6 week treatment duration so we don't uh, use direct formula in that case you can use the uh, the formula which we have given you you can take the value of u and v as uh, two, uh, 1.96 and 0.84 and you can calculate it because unnecessary uh, we uh, we don't uh, want you to calculate it using direct formula you can do it the sample size comes uh, exactly the same even if you use the formula there is no problem with that you can do it at home and if there is any other problem you can come uh, you can write us at the merit india support uh, dot com merit india at the rate support dot com so this research question this is the example whether there is a difference in the efficacy of this uh, mitazapine which is the new drug and sertraline which is a standard drug for the treatment of resistant depression in 6 weeks treatment duration so the efficacy of sertraline was 40 40% and the expected efficacy of this mitazapine which was a new drug was 58% the minimal acceptable clinical difference they have taken as 10% the level of significance as 5% power of study as 80% and it was a both sided hypothesis so i'll also do it you also do it this we have taken from a reference they have given it as a exercise this thing so 40% 58% and then uh, 10% was the margin except this uh, the superiority margin 5% and 80% so i'll go back to the statulator here you can see the 40% was the in the control that was the sertalin and uh, here in the uh, this thing was 58% so i'll write 0.58 and this margin they have set as 10% so i'll make it as 0.1 and then if i press as calculate it is 479 so 479 in each arm a total sample size of 958 am if i am not taking any drop out or any other sample size adjustment so this is again one example we can skip that so this is uh, we are uh, after this webinar we are going to have a workshop on sample size calculation also because here uh, it is uh, not possible for us to tell you all the concept because in such a short duration 
and in this case uh, you can get all these uh, powerpoint presentations as well as recording in the this merit india uh, team and uh, you will get the previous webinars also and in this case uh, I, I think uh, this presentation also will be uploaded on the website and you will get the powerpoint and the presentations uh, this uh, recording of this session as well yes so now i think uh, yes previous webinar it is there in uh, all these uh, merit india website it is there so the next sample size webinar is for the non inferiority and equivalent style which is on 10th may again at the same time and you will get the previous recording also. Yes, so yes, uh, uh, Shiv, uh, uh, Shivaji is writing that uh, elaborate what is both sided alternative hypothesis in super superiority trial, because as far as I understood superiority trial uh, only look at in the one direction. So yes, I agree with you that in superiority trial, we generally always take all, although it is written that it is both way, ideally it should be one sided. So the required sample size will be lesser because you always say that your treatment is superior. So it is one sided hypothesis. You are right. I, I do agree with you. There any, uh, can you show me any other question? Okay, so equality and equivalence. Yes, we will see. Uh, Equality and equivalence is different. In, e in equality, we say that both group has got zero difference. That is a null hypothesis. Whereas in equivalence, we will see that we take a margin of plus minus. So like superiority you have seen, you also define the inferiority margin that is the minus five. So you say that if your treatment is within plus minus 5% difference with the existing one, you are not going to consider it as a clinically significant. So that we call it as an equivalence trial. So in equivalence, you set a margin which is plus minus 5% in both the direction. Whereas in equality, you say that it is zero. That means you set this, all this null hypothesis is that means the difference is zero. And in alternate hypothesis, whatever is the difference, you will call it as a significant difference. Then uh, Hari is writing, ma'am, how did we come up with the mean of test group even before performing the study? It is based on your judgment. That's what I am saying. You can take a criteria like how much difference you think that it will be clinically significant. So it is based in one study. Did, did you remember? She talked. I'll show you one thing. She talked to the uh, obstetricians and gynecologists. See. What she has written, she or he, I'm not uh, going by gender, that following discussions with, because they are not sure that by how much percentage they think that it is going to be significant. So following discussions with the infectious disease experts and obstetrician, we determined that the absolute reduction, absolute reduction of SSI of 5% would be clinically important. So I said in the beginning that it is the most difficult decision to decide which difference you think that it is clinically significant. It can be done based on your experience. If you think that you are not experienced enough, you can talk to your seniors, you can talk to your colleague, you can review literature, you can see the previous literature, and then you can decide the, that acceptable margin. In this quasi-experimental group, yes, it is a, uh, it is there in plan. We will discuss that too also. But since time is uh, time was less, so we did not include that. But definitely, we will we will address that quasi-experimental too, where where we are not randomizing. Minakshi is asking. So clinical significance is more important for determining superiority. See, it's the researcher. I I, I should not be saying that what is more more important because many a time. They say that, uh, you know, one millimeter difference or two millimeter difference. But if you ask me, like for clinician, it is it should be the clinical difference, which is important because then I'm not saying that the statistical difference is not important. Based on that clinical difference, you calculate the sample size though, so that you can prove your hypothesis. Ultimately, your sample size calculation will be based on your clinical judgment. 
if you don't get any literature if already there is literature uh, existing which is showing up then you can take that much in your difference malaya is writing what if the test group turns out to be worse than the control group in superiority trial yes there is a there are so many articles writing this that a rejection of superiority trial is doesn't mean that it is inferior or it is non equivalent they it uh, there are many factors of coming that as non significant or the test group being worse than the control group so there there are it's a separate session what factors you should consider when the superiority trial doesn't come as a significant trial we may share those articles with you where you can read those article because it's a it's a lengthy discussion but yes definitely one thing which i would like to make a point here that a rejection of null this uh, uh, if the superiority trial is not significant you cannot say that the drug was inferior you cannot say you have to look for other thing as well before saying such and then uh, again uh, maybe repeat trial maybe a better sample size maybe some better methodology maybe there may be there are many biases in uh, in such trials you know that so we are not discussing those epidemiological uh, biases or epidemiological reason for not coming that particular because there may be some other factors as well ascertainment bias there are information bias there is a selection bias there are so many biases so minakshi is can uh, you please take a class on how to calculate superiority margin superiority margin it's set we don't calculate the superiority margin you you assume it based either based on the previous literature or based on your clinical decision we never calculate the superiority margin you you see that it is it is already set so you define it that what will be the margin which is which is significant for you right okay so then uh, we uh, you will get all the materials in the website and do visit the website you will find the previous recorded uh, all the lectures all the videos there and the new this thing upcoming alert for the upcoming uh, webinar or upcoming courses or workshop also so uh...